Hello, you're welcome for uh, this lecture series. Uh, today we are discussing recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, it de defines as uh, three or more consecutive pregnancy losses, and that occurs before uh, the age of 28. And you remember 28 here is the age of viability in our country here. Uh, in some countries, uh, the age of viability can be 20 or 24. Uh, this recurrent pregnancy loss affect up to 2% of pregnancies, um, of uh, effect of 2% of women of reproductive age. Uh, some guidelines uses different definitions, like the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, uh, they use a lower cutoff. If you have two or more pregnancy loss, you actually require to be uh, having a recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, in some cases, you may need to actually have uh, an evaluation of the fetal heart. If the fetal heart is already uh, present um, before the pregnancy loss, or when a woman is older than 35 years, uh, or when a woman has difficulties in getting pregnant, you may actually set a lower threshold of two uh, or more pregnancy losses. You don't need to wait for someone to lose um, three pregnancies when they're above 35 years or when they have morphologically normal fetus. That means the fetal heart is really present or they actually have difficulties um, the, the getting a, a pregnancy. Um, it can be primary uh, or secondary. In some literature, people even talk about uh, tertiary pregnancy losses, uh, retrograde pregnancy losses. The primary one is that occurs before someone has actually had a viable pregnancy, has never had uh, carried a pregnancy before b b beyond 28 weeks of gestation. Uh, secondary pre pregnancy loss can occur when someone's already had more than, uh, has already had some pregnancy that was cut beyond uh, the age of viability. Um, uh, let's look at the epidemiology of recurrent pregnancy loss. We already said that uh, it affects up to 1 to 2 percent of the women of reproductive age. But also, um, we need to know that pregnancy loss is a very common thing, uh, and this affects up to 15 percent. What I mean here is that the pregnancy, uh, pregnancy losses that occurs in the population is up to 15 percent, but not necessarily recurrent pregnancy losses. And this criteria, I mean, this definition, this prevalence depends on the, on the, on the, on the definitions and the criteria used for making a diagnosis, for, making a, for defining the recurrent pregnancy loss. If you use a lower threshold, maybe two or more pregnancy losses, maybe the prevalence will actually be higher than this. There are a number of risk factors that can actually post a pregnancy to uh, a mother to recurrent pregnancy loss. Maternal age is very key here. We need to remember that as the mother grows older, the quality of the oocytes remain uh, poorer, becomes poorer and poorer and poorer. Also, when a woman has had previous miscarriages, the risk that they have another miscarriage is quite high. So that should be at the back of your mind when you're managing um, a patient. Also, people who have uh, obesity, um, they are at increased risk of getting recurrent pregnancy loss. There may be some environmental factors. If you sleep in, a, stay in a place where they take a lot of cigarettes, or you yourself, you actually smoke, or you take a lot of caffeine, you're more likely to have that. Uh, this pie chart tells us uh, the, 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 the distribution of causes of recurrent pregnancy losses. And this will also uh, help to uh, direct us what we can do when we are investigating a patient with recurrent pregnancy losses. You realize that up to 50% of these uh, pregnancy losses are unexplained causes. So much as you try to look for it, at the back of your mind, just know that up to 50% of the pre recurrent pregnancy losses, you may not actually find the cause. Uh, infection on account for uh, 
up to 5%. And this is a common thing in clinical setting. You find people want to look for syphilis, they want to look for some urinary tract infection, you want to look for some intrauterine infection, or maybe malaria, yet this occurs only in 5% of cases. So that should also be at the back of your mind. It is uh, important to uh, investigate some endocrine factors that could have contributed that. Or autoimmune diseases that we'll look at at the end of this lecture. And then other anatomical defects, this can be investigated. The genetic factors can be a little bit hard to investigate, but you can also speculate them as you manage these patients. Um, the genetic factors, let's start with the genetic factors. Um, uh, the genetic factors uh, may actually cause repetitive first trimester uh, abortion. And most of these babies, most of these fetuses actually end up as an embryonic pregnancies. Um, um, there may be issue of malformations or mental retardation of the mother. Uh, so you need to go back and look at the history of the mother. Also, it occurs more in advanced ages, ages of the mother. Uh, um, it is very unlikely to cause um, a pregnancy loss in the in the second trimester. So, if you find pregnancy losses that occurs in the second trimester, it's very unlikely to be genetic. Although some may actually occur in the early uh, second trimester. Uh, a management for genetic uh, cause of recurrent pregnancy loss should be you need to consider actually genetic counseling. And this is something that is done by professional counselors who have done some genetics. Uh, uh, you may also do assisted reproductive technology, including perigestational um, diagnosis. That means that you need to diagnose if uh, the, 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 the fetus or the embryo that is formed is having a defect or a genetic defect. Uh, if it is because of a problem with the man, which, is, which can occur, you may need actually a sperm donor. Or if you think the problem is actually a woman, you may actually need an oocyte donor to, to help in that case. So the treatment is rather difficult. Uh, the other cause of recurrent pregnancy loss can be uterine factors. And this can be acquired or congenital. Uh, uh, congenital uterine anomalies occurs in up to 7% of women of reproductive age uh, versus 2% 2, 2 of all women. Of, I mean, congenital uterine anomalies occurs up to 7% in women with recurrent pregnancy loss compared to 2% of these. So that means uh, they are more likely to cause that. Uh, the, the, the pathogenesis of causing this is, is not very clear although it may be because of reduced uh, intrauterine volume or because of poor vasculature, especially if you have a uterine septum and the, the, the fetus get implanted on the septum which has poor blood supply is more likely to be lost. Uh, congenital uh, causes can be uh, due to brings about septed uterus that occurs in 60% in of recurrent pregnancy loss. If you have septic uterus, you're likely to cause 60% of uh, pregnancy losses. Uh, Unicornial uterus uh, can uh, cause 50% of pregnancy losses. Among those with unicornial uterus, 50% of the, pre actually half of the pregnancy is lost. As well as uterine diadelphies, biconate uterus. Um, also people who have been exposed to diethyl stilbesterol may actually cause a uh, uterine uh, problem. This is a drug that was initially used for treating morning sickness. And they realized that babies born to mothers who had been getting these drugs get severe uterine anomalies. Uh, and it was stopped. But it's still being used for treating um, nausea and vomiting in chemotherapy. So uh, sometimes uh, accidentally you get pregnant when you're in chemotherapy and you end up with this. Um, Acquired uterine anomalies may be like uh, um, fibroids. It's very contentious that fibroid cause uterine, I mean, pre pregnancy losses. But unless it, it is causing some uh, 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 defect within the endometrial cavity, 
then it might actually cause that. If you have uh, adhesions within the uterine cavity, mm -hmm. that may actually cause that. And then uh, in competent cervix, this will have a, a discussion about it in another lecture that uh, I'll actually send it out. Um, Unicornet uterus can, can be uh, managed uh, either surgical or, or you may not need to actually look at uh, do the surgery to enlarge the unicornet uterus. Um, of course, um, expectant management is very important and then in some cases people actually uh, put sacrilege although this is a bit reserved. Uh, and this may actually present uh, because of volume issues and then the pregnancy will actually get out. And that's how a septed uterus is formed and you really, really see that this is the septum that is present um, there. Um, um, of course, you can remove the, the septum and then uh, if you must do surgery for uh, diadelphies, you only do it if there's a longitudinal septum that separates the vagina. You know, in, long, in diadelphies, that means you have two uterus, and that may actually mean you also have two hypervaginal porch. Um, and so if it is present, maybe you need to resolve that uh, septum to help uh, in improving the reproductive outcome. Um, by corneate uterus, um, Unification can actually be done. Ut uterine uh, unification can be done, and then the Strassmann, Strassmann abdominal metroplasty is a procedure that is used to actually uh, unify the two ones. Um, leomyoma, as I say, it is very contentious. Uh, relations between leomyoma and then recurrent pregnancy loss is is not very clear, and then. Um, um, the pregnancy outcome adversely affected by only submucosal uh, 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 myoma. So if the uterus is not there, you don't need to. Or if you have intramural myomas bigger than five centimeters, then you may actually need to consider removal. But tiny fibrates less than five centimeters, you don't need to uh, concentrate much on that. Uh, um, of course, surgery is reserved for only um, myomas that actually cause, uh, distorts the uterine cavity uh, and, and, and then probably the size. Um, you can also consider doing these other surgeries, in, uh, other methods of hysterectomy, Hyster I mean myomectomy, that can be done. Um, of course, Asaman syndrome, if you have that, how do you uh, treat uh, Asaman syndrome? I guess you may need to read into details. But of course, it includes DNC and probably putting a copper IUD and then uh, putting someone on, on a combined oral contraceptives for some time. Um, um, endocrine factors. I think this is also very important for us to discuss. Uh, like if you have thyroid uh, disease, you're more likely to have recurrent pregnancy losses maybe hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism is a very uh, important factor in causing pregnancy losses. A patient with uncontrolled diabetes is more likely to lose a pregnancy. And then people who have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a very uh, common endocrine, endocrine anomaly in, among women of reproductive age. Um, it's important that uh, these women are more likely to get luteal phase defects and uh, resultant pregnancy losses. As I said, uh, hypothyroidism, which is a thyroid disorder, is more likely to cause that, as well as hyperthyroidism. It would be good to get it into details. Um, this is what about what we talk about diabetes. Of course, controlling the HbA1c, HbA1c actually uh, increases, uh, mean reduces the risk of. Um, um, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss or pregnancy loss. So in a well-controlled diabetes, you're less likely to have that. As I said, polycystic ovarian syndrome is more likely to cause a very adverse um, uh, growth. I mean, follicular, the follicles are exposed to adverse conditions and then um, they are poor quality and they are more likely, even if they're fertilized, they're more likely to be lost. 
In luteal phase uh, insufficiency, normally um, the corpus luteum uh, is uh, produced after uh, an ovulation, and this corpus luteum continues producing progesterone. Uh, this progesterone helps the endometrium to actually become succulent and maintain the pregnancy. This continues until a placenta is formed between 12, about, about 12 weeks. In some cases, you realize that the corpus luteum will fail before it reaches 12 weeks. And that means that uh, uh, the, 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 the protective role of progesterone is actually withdrawn and then the pregnancy actually, you lose the pregnancy. Um, um, of course, how do you make a diagnosis of uh, 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 luteal phase defects. Uh, the gold standard, of course, is to do endometrial biopsy, but this is not preferred because it is invasive in nature. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, if you consider someone has a very uh, short luteal phase, normally luteal phase is supposed to be uh, 14 days, but if they have shorter than 13 days luteal phase, then they actually have a luteal phase insufficiency. You may also need to consider doing day 21 um, uh, progesterone and see that the day progesterone, uh, 21 progesterone will tell you that uh, probably you have uh, um, a pseudo, I mean, a luteal phase uh, deficiency. Uh, in most cases, we try to uh, give progesterone to protect, we call this luteal support. Luteal support is normally given with progesterone in a dose of 600 to 800 milligram daily is considered adequate. And the commonest uh, progesterone in our market is actually Prosta, which is a natural progesterone. Um, infection, as I said, occurs only in 5% in of cases. So I, I leave that, this to you to go and, and read more about it. When you come to classes, to the class, we will actually discuss about this uh, infection, especially the touches you need to understand them. Uh, immunological factors can be autoimmune or alloimmunity. The alloimmunity occurs when antibodies are directed to antigens, especially if it is directed to the phytoantigen. And then autoimmunity is when it is directed to a particular tissue. Uh, and then that, that, that's basically what you need to understand. I also em implore you that you go and read more about um, how the baby actually uh, uh, escaped the maternal um, immunity since it is a foreign body. So you, you need to read and then we'll, when you come for the lecture, I mean come for the physical interactive lectures, we'll actually discuss about that. Um, the autoimmune conditions are these. The commonest is actually antiphospholipid I mean, systemic lipase erythematosus, SLG, and this occurs, uh, uh, the pregnancy losses may occur more in the second and third trimester. Uh, this is up to, cause up to 20% of pregnancy losses. And then we also have antiphospholipid syndrome, which occur, cause 5% uh, of uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. And then, um, Antiphospholipid antibodies induce microthombri uh, can cause uh, mean pathology within the placental site, and this will alter vascularities, and then uh, this will actually affect the, the embryo, the, the utero placental unit, and when this is affected, uh, more likely to lose a pregnancy. Um, uh, we will discuss more about this, I think, in the next slide. But of course, this is another study that shows that up to 15% of these actually have antiphospholipid mm -hmm. abnormalities or antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, now, how do you diagnose uh, antiphospholipid syndrome? You use actually the modified uh, Sydney um, uh, criteria or the Sapporo criteria of 2006. But this one, you may not need to remember it very well. But maybe for your practice, you need to do that. Um, when do we start treatment? Um, of course, we treat with heparin and aspirin. 
uh, and then that's when you can actually start treatment. It's preferred as soon as someone, you actually document a pregnancy, you may need to start this and you tighter the volume of aspirin, I mean the volume of, of uh, aparin according to the INR, uh, INR, the international normalized ratio. But normally dose of aspirin of 75 to 80 milligram daily is adequate as soon as pregnancy is documented. Uh, there may be some other inherited thrombophilias. You know, these thrombophilias may actually cause bleeding behind the, the gestational sac and then cause a displacement and recurrent pregnancy losses. So it is important that uh, you need to look at them. These other factors, the absence of these factors may also cause a problem. Um, these are the inherited uh, thrombophilias. This is what I was talking about, the uh, thrombosis and whatnot. Uh, you need to go and read about it. Uh, maybe you will need to consider using anti-thrombotic anti drugs like uh, the heparin and then the, the, the aspirin. The mechanisms, I mean, the, 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 the pathophysiology of antiphospholipid syndrome and then this and other microthrombi is actually similar. That's why the treatment also is uh, similar. Um, um, and this is how you can actually be able to evaluate patients who have antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, you may need to look at other things. There may be more than that, just the pregnancy loss, okay, uh, that you, you're looking at. Mm. Family history of recurrent pregnancy loss is very key there. And then a previous diagnostic test that was done. Um, um, how do you investigate uh, a patient who has recurrent pregnancy loss? Uh, this gives you a, a, a very systematic way of making sure that all the other factors are looked at. Uh, if it is genetic, you look what you need to do. If it is anatomical, what do you need to do? Endocrine, you need to do that. And then immunological, what you need to do, the anticardiolipin antibodies, lipase anticoagulant antibodies, the uh, beta anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies. Very important to look at, especially when you're looking at uh, antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, if it is uh, because of uh, maybe clotting thrombophilias, you look at uh, uh, antithrombin 3, protein C, protein S, prothrombin gene, and then uh, factor 5, Leiden, and then uh, you also look at uh, prothrombin uh, gene mutation, um, or activated pr protein C. Uh, if it is infectious, you may need to look at endocervical uh, swab as well. Um, the test that may not be useful are the anti-nuclear antibodies. This may not actually be necessary if you're looking at, at uh, anti-autoimmune uh, disorders in a patient. Um, the maternal anti-paternal leukocyte antibodies uh, may not be necessary. And then HLA, human leukocyte antigens, uh, genotyping. And then the mixed lymphocyte maternal pro, uh, paternal cell cultures, you may need to, because these are very expensive and they may not help you uh, come to uh, a conclusive uh, diagnosis. Um, how do we manage patients who are idiopathic? You realize that idiopathic occurs in up to 50% in the previous uh, um, uh, chart, that pie chart that we saw. Um, so that means that uh, we need to craft a way of managing them. Of course, counseling uh, is very important. Sometimes you consider giving empiric folic acid. Uh, we, if there is a suspect in the nutritional deficiency, you need to work on that. If they suspect uh, uh, I mean bacterial infection or an infectious uh, agent, you consider giving uh, antibiotics. You may also need to look at doing luteal support. Mm. Uh, at post-conception, you need to actually reassure them and then do some tender loving care. Sometimes it's attention that will give them. Mm. Uh, 
prophylactic aspirin is key, prophylactic uh, cartilage, sometimes you do everything. This is like you're doing everything for someone. Um, as soon as they actually uh, approaching maturity, you consider giving steroids, uh, you monitor closely near term near, near using non-stress test, and then ultrasound, uh, ultrasound uh, uh, scanning. Yes, and um, basically that. Thank you.